The DJ at the reception had a perfect record. Shannon thought every song he played was one she hated. Of course, she hadn't wanted to come to the wedding in the first place, but since it was Robert's old college roommate who was getting married, she really didn't have an option. Where was her husband anyway, she wondered. There he was, over by the bar, deep in conversation with some guy she didn't know. This is worse than going to somebody else's high school reunion, she thought morosely. Hey! Pick a female voice yelled from the doorway, and Shannon's head shot up in surprise. Looking around, she spotted a young woman her own age with a drink in her hand. Tracy, she squealed. What are you doing here? I haven't seen you in forever. The two young women embraced excitedly. Then Tracy turned toward the man who accompanied her. Hey, Darren, this is Shannon, my best friend forever from back in high school. Shannon, this is Darren, my boyfriend. As Tracy made the introductions, Shannon looked the young man over with interest. He was a little over six feet tall with jet black hair combed back from his face. His jaw was covered in dark stubble and a silver earring flashed from one ear. Unlike most of the men at the reception, Darren was clad in tight black jeans and a black leather bomber jacket worn over a black t-shirt. Tracy found herself a bad boy, Shannon thought enviously. The couple joined Shannon at her table, and the two women began to talk animatedly while Darren ignored them and scanned the surroundings in amused contempt. It quickly became apparent to Shannon that Tracy had already hit the bar several times judging by how loudly she was talking, but Shannon was just glad to see a familiar face in the throng. When their conversation paused, Darren took advantage of the opportunity. He turned to Tracy and pointed at Shannon. You said her name was Shannon. Why did you call her back earlier? Tracy laughed a little too loudly. Because she's a preacher's kid, she said, and we never let her forget it. The truth was that there was no way anyone least of all Shannon, would ever forget that her father was the minister of a Methodist church in suburban Philadelphia. His position meant that she was expected to behave as a role model for others. But like so many offspring of religious figures, she responded by rebelling every chance she got in every way that she could find to her parents' unending dismay in school. Despite being bright and quick to learn, she performed poorly and was a constant disciplinary problem. By the age of 14, she was already sneaking out of the house to meet up with the type of boys of which her parents did not approve. She experimented with pot and alcohol, but fortunately did not have a tendency to addiction. She was similarly lucky with love. A pregnancy scare early on drove home the importance of contraception, and although she continued to be sexually active, she always made her partners use protection. Her parents were not aware of just how loose her morals were, but they despaired of the crowd she ran with, especially the boys she dated. Why can't you find a nice young man? Her mother asked, on more than one occasion. But her attempts to set her daughter up with dates she considered more suitable were met with open defiance. It was in Shannon's junior year of high school that an event altered the direction of her life. Her boyfriend at the time had arrived to pick her up for a date. But when Shannon walked out to his car, she found another girl in the front seat. Despite her date's fervent assertions that he was just giving the other girl a ride, Shannon flew into a jealous rage and refused to go, retreating to her room to sulk. Later that night, she was stunned to get a phone call with the news that her boyfriend and the other girl had been killed in an automobile accident, even though they hadn't, like the boyfriend. Shannon's parents insisted that she go to the funeral. As she sat in the pew during the service, she felt a welter of emotion sorrow at the boy's death, guilt at the angry thoughts she'd had that night, and most of all, fear at how close she'd come to losing her own life. That last emotion caused her to re-examine her lifestyle and make significant changes. Still, a rebel. She nevertheless began to keep her defiance in check. At school, she started to focus on her studies and even got a summer job to bring in some income. She also toned down her partying, being especially careful, around drugs and alcohol. As her parents watched their daughter's transformation, they agreed that the accident, tragic as it was, must have been an act of divine intervention. Thanks to her innate intelligence and the work that she had put into her last year and a half of high school, Shannon was able to score high enough on the placement test to get into the Community College of Philadelphia. She began commuting to the main campus, working toward a degree in business administration. Emboldened by the changes he saw in his daughter's behavior, Shannon's father began to encourage her to take part in some of the activities for singles that his parish offered. Although she showed little enthusiasm, her father went so far as to introduce her to Robert Cunningham, 
a young man in his late twenties who'd begun attending church there. Robert was tall and clean-cut, with wavy brown hair, although he was handsome enough. Shannon was only mildly attracted. He was far too preppy and conventional for a young rebel, attracted to bad boys. But her attitude changed after she learned that the quiet young man was an agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Numerous movies and television shows filled her head with images of danger and daring do, and her interest in him grew accordingly. Robert, in turn, was entranced by the attractive young woman, and the fact that she seemed to share his attitudes and values only increased his desire. Soon the two of them were a couple and Shannon's parents could hardly contain their joy that their prodigal daughter had returned to the fold. By the time Shannon graduated from community college, she and Robert were engaged, and now we're living happily ever, Shannon told Tracy. Her friend instantly picked up on the sarcasm in Shannon's voice. So where is your hubby anyway? She asked Shannon. You mean SpongeBob SquarePants? Shannon replied with barely concealed contempt. What did you call him? Tracy asked with a giggle. SpongeBob SquarePants, Shannon repeated. I call him that because he's a total square and he's sponging up all the fun out of my life, she said bitterly, and Tracy couldn't help but laugh. Come on, Shannon. I thought you'd married a cross between the Lone Ranger and Elliot Ness, she teased. Her words clearly provoked Shannon. It's more like I married a CPA, she said spitefully. No, that's not fair. An accountant would be more exciting than Robert. I don't know what he does. He never talks about his work, and when he comes home, all he wants to do is relax and hang around the house. There's no excitement in my life. No fun at all. She was about to say more when she spotted her husband heading their way. Robert had been talking on his cell phone, and now he had an apologetic look on his face. Before he could speak, however, Shannon introduced him to Tracy and her date. Tracy was my best friend in high school, she said, and Tracy grinned. Robert shook hands, and then turned back to Shannon. Honey, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to make an early evening of it. I'm on call tonight and something has come up at work. Shannon had been none too excited about the wedding reception, but the idea of spending another night at home watching television just added to her foul mood. Before she could respond, however, Tracy intervened. You don't have to take her home, Robert. Darren and I can give her a lift. Let her hang with us for a while. Robert looked at Tracy uncertainly. Shannon hadn't told him much about her high school days, but his impression of Tracy wasn't wholly positive. He wondered how much the young woman had had to drink, although her boyfriend seemed sober enough. But something about him made Robert uneasy as he hesitated. Shannon chimed in. Come on, Robert. I really don't want to sit around the house all by myself on a Saturday night when the reception is over. I'll catch a ride back with Tracy and Darren. All right, he said finally. But it'll probably be pretty late when I get in, so don't wait up for me, honey. With that, he kissed her, and then went to pay his respects to the bride and groom. As soon as the door closed behind him, Shannon turned back to Tracy with a look of gratitude on her face. Thanks, girlfriend. I would have screamed if I'd had to spend another night at home. Let's go get another drink, before they could do so. Darren spoke up. You don't really want to hang around this morgue, do you? Let's go somewhere and have some fun. Yeah, Tracy enthused, her eyes. Shining! Let's blow this place and go find a little excitement. Shannon hesitated momentarily. This wasn't exactly what she told Robert. They do but then she dismissed her reservations. If he's going to go off and play G-Man, there's no reason why I can't go out and have a good time for a change. As the three of them went outside, Shannon was surprised to see Darren and Tracy head for a motorcycle. I haven't ridden on one of those in years, she exclaimed. Can we all fit on it? Sure, Tracy said enthusiastically. You get behind Darren and I'll sandwich you in. What about helmets? Shannon asked. Darren laughed. Helmets are for sissies. He swung his leg over the bike and then turned around to stare openly at Shannon as she hiked up her skirt and climbed on behind him. It only added to the naughtiness of what she was doing, and she felt a little thrill shoot through her at the idea this bad boy might find her attractive. As soon as Tracy had snugged in behind her, Darren took off, revving the powerful engine and peeling away from the wedding party. When he took a sharp turn at high speed, Shannon squealed involuntarily in a mixture of fear and excitement, clinging tightly to the sinewy frame in front of her. Darren turned to give her a knowing grin, and Shannon wished again that her husband was more like him. By the time they got where Darren was taking them, the combination of the engine's vibrations in the lean male body clutched so closely to her had begun to work on Shannon's libido. But as she swung off the bike, she reminded herself, somewhat regretfully, that Darren belonged to Tracy. 
when the three of them entered through the below street level door. Shannon realized their destination was a dance club. The pounding music and flashing lights immediately took her back to her wild younger days, and she almost skipped across the floor as they made their way through the semi-darkness. Tracy immediately headed for the bar. Hey, I want to do some shots. How about you guys? Before Shannon could answer, Darren grabbed her hand and leaned over to speak into her ear above the noise. Want to try something way better than booze? He asked forcefully. You'll like it, I promise. Shannon pulled back and looked into his eyes. They seemed to bore into her, and she found that she wanted to prove herself to him. Okay, what is it? He grinned. Allow me introduce you to Molly. When Shannon looked at him in confusion, he did something quick and supple, and suddenly he was holding two pastel-colored tablets in the palm of his hand as she watched him. He took one of them, popped it in his mouth, and downed it. She stared at him a moment more, then made her decision and swallowed her own tab. You're going to love Molly. He laughed, and she felt as though the two of them were conspirators. Then he turned toward the bar corral Tracy and yelled to the two of them, Come on, let's dance! The three of them squeezed their way into the crowd and began dancing together. At one point, Shannon leaned in to yell into Darren's ear. What about Tracy? Doesn't she like Molly? He shook his head in the negative. Booze is her thing. He yelled back, and sure enough, Tracy disappeared again, only to reappear shortly, clutching another shot glass in her hand. After dancing a while, Shannon began to feel a sense of warmth and well-being come over her. The music seemed to mesh with her mellow mood, and the rhythms of the lights blended with the motion of her body as she danced to the driving beat. She crowded closer to Darren and Tracy, and the three of them felt like one being to her. The sensation was amazing, unlike anything she'd felt before. After a while, she vaguely noticed that Tracy had found a vacant chair and proceeded to pass out. Darren went to check on her, and Shannon felt a slight sense of loss, but he quickly reappeared and now began to devote all his attention to Shannon. A feeling of euphoria came over her, and as the music flowed on, she wished the night would never end. Sometime later, she groggily watched as Darren picked up Tracy's inert body and threw it over his shoulder. Then he took Shannon's hand and led her out with him to his motorcycle. He propped Tracy on the seat in front of him and drooped her over the handlebars. Then he motioned to Shannon to swing on behind him and fired up the big bike. They could have ridden for minutes or hours, Shannon had no sense of time. All she was aware of was the rush of the wind, the vibrations coming up through the seat, and the warmth of the body in front of her. Finally, they came to a stop at an apartment building somewhere in the city, and then Darren was carrying Tracy again as Shannon followed. Once the three of them were inside the apartment door, he unceremoniously flopped the unconscious woman onto the couch. Shannon came up behind him and wrapped herself around him, her still swaying to the music in her head. Darren turned and looked at her hungrily, and Shannon instantly felt a matching heat within her. Without a word, he pulled her into the bedroom and began kissing her hotly. She ran her hand over the front of his jeans and then began frantically tugging at his belt. He began pulling at her clothes as well, and in their haste they tumbled onto the unmade bed. It was rough and animalistic. When she finally opened her eyes, she saw Darren pulling on his clothes. She lifted herself up on her elbows to stare at him groggily. That was incredible, she said. It felt like we made it forever. Just how long did it last anyway? He glanced at his, watched, and smirked at her. About two hours, he said. Her mind balked at that. No way. We were having love for two solid hours. He gave her a sly grin. I told you you'd like Molly. She slumped back down on the bed. I will never be the same, she said in exhaustion. Then the implications of what he just told her sank in. What time is it? She asked apprehensively. Nearly two he said over his shoulder. She gasped. Two o'clock. Oh my god. I've got to get home. By the time she had frantically pulled on her clothes, Darren was waiting for her as they hurried through the living room to the apartment door. Shannon noticed Tracy still passed out on the couch. Thank god for that, she thought guiltily. Not wanting to face the girlfriend, she had just betrayed the trip to her house took only fifteen minutes. But to Shannon, it felt like an hour as they rode. She desperately tried to concoct some plausible excuse to explain to her husband why she was so late, but she still wasn't thinking clearly and could come up with nothing. When Darren pulled up in front of Shannon's home, she hastily swung off the bike. She wanted to say something to him, but her thoughts and emotions were so jumbled that all she could do was mumble. Thanks. I just thanks. He grinned and quickly pulled away from the curb with a wave. 
Then, as she turned toward the house, the fear she'd been suppressing really hit her. She did her best to unlock the door quietly, hoping desperately that Robert would be asleep if she could just somehow slip into bed without waking him. She thought maybe she could come up with some excuse in the morning, but to her surprise, when she peeked in the bedroom, Robert wasn't there. She thanked her father's God for this undeserved blessing and hastily tore off her clothes in the dark, hiding them in the bottom of the laundry basket. She wanted to get a shower, but she dared not take the time in case Robert caught her and realized how late she'd been out. Instead, she threw on her nightgown and dove into bed, heaving a deep sigh of relief at her close call. Just how lucky she was became clear when she heard Robert's key in the door only a few minutes later. Suddenly, a frightening thought crossed her mind. What if he wants to make love? She'd worn her underwear to bed and stuffed tissues in them to keep from leaking on the sheets, but nothing would save her if he began groping down there. Then it came to her. The best way to forestall such a catastrophe was to take the initiative herself, not with passion, but anger. So when he tiptoed into the bedroom, she reached over and switched on the bedside lamp. Where in the heck have you been? She stormed at him so fiercely that he involuntarily took a step back. I told you, he stammered. I had to go out on business. You've used that excuse too many times before, she snapped back. I'm beginning to think you're seeing someone. He was aghast. No, honey, I'd never do anything like that. I love you. I... But she was in full stride now and not about to yield the advantage. Well, if you're not seeing someone, tell me what you were doing, she demanded. I can't do that, honey, he pleaded. Can't or won't, she replied, obstinately. It had been a long, hard night for Robert, and his weariness and frustration at his wife's unfair accusations overcame his reticence. It was a crime scene, he said wearily. I had to go investigate a crime scene. Inwardly, Shannon rejoiced that her tactics were working, but she didn't want to let him off the hook so quickly. Crime happens every day, Robert. What made this so special that you had to be out until all hours of the night? He sighed in resignation and began to speak in a low, cold voice. You really want to know? All right, then. It was a murder, actually. A double hit. Two guys we've been after for a long time got executed tonight. Whoever did it hauled them out to a landfill, put a gun to their heads, and killed them. By now. Resignation had turned to resentment at being forced to reveal what he had tried to shield Shannon from, and Robert kept on with his description of the scene. They put bags over their heads, tied their hands behind them, and forced them to kneel in the garbage before they shot them. You know why they put bags over their heads? He demanded, and Shannon shrank back at his vehemence. I guess so. They couldn't see the faces of the men who kidnapped them, she ventured. They didn't give a darn if their victims saw them, Robert said in an angry tone. Have you ever seen a bullet hit a melon? The same thing happens when you shoot a man in the head. They put bags over their heads to keep the brains from splattering everywhere. He shook his head at the memory and stared off into space. Both of them were shot in the back of the head when the medical examiners pulled the bags off. There wasn't much left of their faces. He shook his head as if to clear away the memory. Anyway, that's what I was out doing while you and your friends were having fun at the wedding reception. Are you satisfied now? He asked bitterly. Shannon said nothing but her pale face and wide eyes made clear the impact his story had made. Robert quickly finished undressing, climbed into bed, and pointedly turned his back to Shannon. She switched off the bedside light and pulled the covers around her, pleased that her stratagem had successfully diverted his attention. What a wild night, she thought, and rolled over to go to sleep. But as she drifted off, the image that came to her mind was not her encounter with Darren, but the execution-style slaying that Robert had described. Her last conscious thought was to wish she hadn't pushed Robert quite so far. Shannon slept till noon the next morning. Robert was cool to her when she finally arose, but he began to warm up to her as the afternoon went on. Yet, instead of being relieved that his anger had faded, Shannon just felt depressed. Saturday night had been an exciting and satisfying adventure, but now her life was already returning to the routine she found so boring, leaving her even more restless. Her encounter with Stacy, and especially Darren, had reawakened impulses and desires she hadn't felt since high school to resume. Her humdrum existence seemed almost unbearable now. She was still depressed the next morning when she left for work, but that was the way work made her feel most mornings. Her business administration degree had qualified her for a position at the school district of Philadelphia, and she had managed to land a job as administrative assistant 
to the director of procurement services. Shannon didn't care for the director. The man was a lecher who was always trying to sneak a peek down her blouse or up her skirt, but she was glad to have a job. She even made it a point to give her boss a few inadvertent looks to ensure a good annual evaluation. Nevertheless, the work was mostly mind-numbing routine, and she had quickly tired of it. But this Monday held a surprise when the director went out to the lobby to greet a visitor and brought him back to the office. Shannon almost gasped out loud. The visitor was none other than Darren. He was wearing a suit and tie. His hair was combed back in a conservative style, and he'd removed the silver earring, but there was no doubt it was him. A slight grin crossed Darren's face when he spotted Shannon, but he said nothing and gave no other sign of recognition. As the two men went into the director's office and the door closed behind them, Shannon's mind was a whirl. Memories of Saturday night came flooding back to her, and she was full of questions about Darren's unexpected reappearance and his meeting with her boss. Curiosity overcame her, and she clicked on the intercom system while carefully turning down the volume. The office still had an old system that enabled the director to give her instructions without leaving his desk. Shannon had long ago figured out how she could use it for eavesdropping. It was risky, but she was too curious to resist temptation. After listening to their conversation for a while, she was even more perplexed. Darren seemed to be no more than another salesman trying to sell cleaning and office supplies to the school system. She could hardly believe that Saturday night's bad boy on a motorcycle could be a soap salesman by day. But the longer she listened, the more something seemed odd about their negotiations. Darren told her boss he represented a new business in the area, trying to establish a relationship with the school system. The director didn't seem particularly receptive at first, but then the tone of the conversation changed. Our company is eager to show you how competitive we can be, Darren said in a confident voice, so eager that we're prepared to make you a very special offer. It's not unusual for us to do business through a broker, and when we do, we pay the broker a 10% commission. Since there's no broker in this case, we'd be willing to offer you that same commission as a token of appreciation for helping us get our foot in the door. Shannon could hear the sound of the director rocking back in his desk chair, and she could just imagine the expression on his face. You said a 10% commission, the director said, as though he was barely interested in what would be the limit on the order size. No limit at all, Mr. Director, Darren answered smoothly. The commission would remain the same and apply to any size order. If you wanted a year's supply for the entire school district, we'd be happy to accommodate you. And how would this commission be paid? Shannon's boss asked a little too quickly. Our company is not big on procedures and red tape, Darren replied glibly. I could bring you a cashier's check if that would be satisfactory. There was a long pause, and Shannon wondered what was happening. Then, she heard her boss start up again. We at the procurement office are always interested in developing new resources for the district's needs. I think we'd like to place an order with your firm in this amount. The intercom clearly picked up the sound of a sheet of paper being slid across the desk. Very good, sir, Darren replied. I'll have your commission check ready late tomorrow morning, Shannon thought. She heard the two men shake hands and she assumed their negotiations were done. But then Darren spoke up again, this time in a slightly different tone of voice. Mr. Director, there is one other consideration I need to inform you about. Our company has experienced some unfortunate changes of heart, you might say in the past, on the part of others to whom we've made a similar offer. We've paid the commission only to have the order get cancelled or sharply reduced. Accordingly, our company now requires simultaneous payment for the order. Moreover, since we're paying the commission by cashier's check, it's only fair that we require that the order be paid for the same way by cashier's check. Shannon heard the director's chair sit upright abruptly. This is most unusual, the director harumph. I don't even know if I have the authority to issue a cashier's check, especially for such a large amount. You're right, came Darren. Silky voice. It is unusual, but so is the commission we're offering you. I'm sure you'd find it would come in very handy just now. Of course, if you feel you need to lower the size of your order to meet departmental standards, I'd certainly understand. There was another long pause, and Shannon found herself listening eagerly. Finally, the director spoke up. No, no, I think we can handle that, but be sure you're back here before noon. I have a luncheon to attend tomorrow, and I don't know how late it will run, thought Shannon, who knew the director had no such luncheon on his schedule. He wants to deposit that check as quickly as possible. She quickly shut off the intercom and pretended to be hard at work at her computer as the two men came out of the director's office. Thank you again, sir, 
I look forward to a long and mutually rewarding relationship between our organizations. Darren gushed. Then he turned and left without even a glance at Shannon as she drove home from work that afternoon. Shannon couldn't stop thinking about what she had overheard. She might not be a lawyer or policeman, but she knew a bribe when she heard one offered. She wasn't particularly surprised that Darren might offer a bribe to get the district's business, but she still couldn't see him as a sales rep, even a crooked one. And then there was this whole business about the cashier's checks. Once he'd gotten the director to agree to the deal, why would Darren risk the whole thing by throwing in that curveball? She'd have to think on that one some more. Her thoughts turned to the director, and she shook her head in disgust that the old lecher was willing to accept a bribe. Didn't surprise her either, and for a moment she wondered if she ought to report what had happened to someone. But the thought quickly passed. It wasn't her problem, but her thoughts kept returning to Darren. She'd never expected to see him again. To have him appear at her workplace started a flood of emotions. She was having trouble controlling. That night she dreamed about him. The next morning, when Darren arrived at the building, the director rushed out to usher him into his office like a celebrity. No interruptions. Shannon. He barked at her and Shannon had to struggle to control her grimace. As soon as the two men disappeared behind the closed door, she quickly switched on the intercom. When the director asked if he had the commission, Darren's voice sounded like it had been dipped in oil. I do, he replied. And just to show you how confident my company is in you and the school district, let me present our cashier's check before I even see your order and your payment. Shannon could imagine the scene as the director snatched the check and scanned it anxiously. After a pause, she heard him tell Darren, everything seems to be in order. Very well, here's our check, along with our order and the amount we discussed yesterday. I had to pull some strings to get a cashier's check for this amount, but here it is, thank you, sir, came Darren's reply. You won't regret it. And let me remind you that our arrangement will remain in place for any future orders as well. You'll see, this will be a very profitable arrangement for all of us. Very good, the director said. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get to that luncheon I mentioned. The two men came back into the anteroom, and the director told Shannon he was off to lunch. She nodded and told him that she would take her lunch break as well. As soon as the men were gone, Shannon grabbed her coat and hurried out to her car. As she made her way through lunch hour traffic, she wondered what she was getting into. Nevertheless, she continued driving and soon arrived outside the shabby apartments that she'd remembered from Saturday night. She sat in her car and waited, hoping that she'd read the situation correctly. It wasn't long before she saw Darren drive up and stride toward the front door. She quickly hopped out of her car and ran toward him. Darren, wait. He turned to stare, and for a moment, his face revealed his surprise. Then it transformed into a weary stare. Hello, Shannon. You might as well come inside, he said, and held the door for her. There was no one else in the apartment, and once inside he turned to look at her with his arms crossed. What are you doing here? he demanded. Shannon ignored his question. I listened to you, she told him. I heard everything you and the director talked about. I know you bribed him so, he asked in a surly tone. Are you going to turn me in? She ignored him again. Only I think there's more going on than bribery. I don't believe you're a soap salesman. I think you're a con man. I think that check you gave him wasn't any good. Darren's mouth took on a crooked grin, but his eyes didn't smile. You're smarter than I thought. Yes, the whole deal was a con, and the check I gave him was as phony as a politician's promise, he said. But the check he gave me from the school district was good as gold, and I've already cashed it. What happens when the director tries to cash his check and finds out it's a fake? She asked. Won't he have the police after you? Now his grin grew more insolent. That's the beauty of this particular sting. He's screwed no matter what he does. The only way he can report me is to admit that he took a bribe. He probably won't be willing to do that until he's forced to explain why there haven't been any shipments of cleaning supplies. I'll be long gone by then. Then Darren's eyes narrowed. So how much do you want to keep quiet? I don't want your money, she said evenly. This time, he was visibly surprised. No, then what do you want? She looked at him steadily. I want you to take me with you. Her answer caught him off guard, and he stood there thinking for a minute. Then his face relaxed, and his smile returned. Are you sure? Do you really want to leave your loving hubby, your nice home in the suburbs, and your nine-to-five job? He asked mockingly. Do you really want to give all that up to run with me? A look of savage intensity came over her face. I think I've been looking for someone like you my whole life, she said huskily, and threw herself against him, kissing him passionately. 
His hands reached down to grab her hips and press her against him. Shannon began to pant, but before she could do anything more, Darren grabbed her by the hair and yanked her head back to stare into her eyes. I'm leaving town right away. I'll be outside your house in one hour. If you're not ready to go, I'm not waiting for you. We're leaving on your motorcycle? She asked. No, I'll be in a car. Sometimes you have to leave your toys behind when you live this kind of life. What about Stacy? She asked. Like I said, you have to be ready to leave your toys behind. Now get going and be outside your place at 130, or I'll leave you behind as well. Shannon kissed him again and then ran for the door, hopping into her car. She quickly drove to the nearest branch of their bank and withdrew the money from her, checking account and the joint savings account. Then she sped home. Once there, she grabbed a suitcase and makeup bag and hurriedly stuffed them with a few things she felt she couldn't live without. On her way back downstairs, she picked up a piece of paper to write Robert a note, but couldn't think of what to say. Finally, she scribbled sorry and left the note on the kitchen counter along with her wedding ring. Then she went to the front porch to watch for Darren as she sat on the steps. Doubt began to build. This was the craziest, most impulsive thing she had ever done, and her conscience was screaming at her to stop before it was too late. But just at that minute, she saw an undistinguished sedan pull up in front of her house, and with soaring heart, she ran to it, leaving the door to their apartment unlocked. She tossed her bags into the back and then slid into the passenger seat as Darren pulled away from the curb as they drove off. Shannon's thoughts drifted to Robert, and she, for a moment, she felt badly for him. He truly loved her. She knew, and this would hurt him badly. Then she thought about her parents, and how disappointed they would be when they learned what she had done. But it doesn't matter, she thought fiercely. It's my life, and they can't try to run it anymore. I know what I want, and what I need, and I'm going to take it. The next few months went by in a haze for Shannon. Darren had driven south to Wilmington, and the two of them had moved into a cheap motel with long-term rates and a short-term memory. The days and nights were a blurry combination of vacation and honeymoon, filled with smoky nightclubs, drug-induced lassitude, and most of all, hot love, whenever, wherever, and however they wanted it. Nothing was planned. Everything was done on impulse and whim. Shannon loved the lack of responsibility, the opportunity to sleep till noon after partying all night, and the fact that she was no longer answerable to anyone. It was as though she had jumped, shifted back to adolescence, except that there were no parents attempting to rein in her excesses. She thought of them occasionally, as well as Robert. But she pushed those thoughts aside angrily. That was then. This is now, she told herself. I'm living my life on my terms, doing what I want to do. So it was a bit of a shock when Darren woke her from sleep one afternoon and told her that she would have to go to work. We're low on money, he explained. We need to make some cash. By now, Shannon was awake, although still somewhat foggy. What do you want me to do? She asked petulantly. He ignored her attitude. You're going to become a legal secretary, he informed her. But I don't know anything about legal work, she protested. You don't know anything about handling pigeons either. He calmly replied, but you will. First, however, we need to go shopping. That afternoon found them in the Nordstrom's in the Christiana Mall, southwest of downtown Wilmington. As Shannon made her way through the women's department out of the corner of Harry, she spotted Darren strolling several miles away, continuing her shopping. She soon found a black Alexander Wang pencil skirt with a zippered slit at the side. Immediately, she knew it would be ideal, so asked the salesgirl if she could try on her size. The fit was perfect. When she came out of the dressing room, she hung the skirt back on the rack, leaving it sticking out from the others just a little. Then she told the girl that she wanted to shop some more and moved on to blouses. Moving through the displays, Shannon soon focused on a white, long-sleeve model that looked appropriate for the office. Remembering Darren's instructions, she tried on one that was a size smaller than she normally wore. After admiring herself in the dressing room mirror, she returned the blouse to the rack once again, leaving it protruding slightly. From there, she made her way to the shoe department, and after trying on a number of styles, proceeded to select a pair of elegant black high-heeled pumps that she purchased with cash, despite the $300 price tag. Then she strolled casually to the food court and took a seat. Only minutes later, Darren joined her, carrying a large bag from Champ Sports. Did you get everything? She asked anxiously, and when he nodded, she said, Shouldn't we get out of here? Nah, he said dismissively. We're clear. How can you be so sure? She asked. Simple, he said. Stores aren't looking for a man to shoplift women's clothing. 
Somebody might have watched you browsing, but they usually don't pay any attention to a male wandering through the women's department. Then why did I have to buy these expensive shoes? She asked, still uneasy. Three reasons, he said. First, the salespeople in footwear keep a close eye on their merchandise so shoes are hard to swipe. Second, footwear that expensive usually have ID chips that have to be disabled before they leave the store. And finally, if anybody was suspicious of you, they'd forget about you the minute you made a purchase. A shoplifter would never actually buy anything, especially an item that expensive. Despite his reassurances, Shannon was relieved when they finally got back to their motel. Darren turned on the weather channel and watched for a few minutes. Finally, he turned the set off. Looks like tomorrow's going to be a good day for hunting pigeons, he said. Here's what we're going to do. Shannon was not happy about becoming a part of Darren's con game. In her mind, it was one thing to go along for the ride with him. It was quite another to become an active participant, yet she saw no way to avoid it. So at noon the next day, she made her way nervously down Delaware Avenue toward DuPont Park. She was wearing the clothes Darren had shoplifted the previous day, and she hoped she looked like the secretary she was supposed to be. She'd already noted Darren on the opposite side of the street and half a block ahead of her as she got to the small park. He made an unobtrusive gesture with his hand, and she looked to her right to see a man seated on a bench near the fountain. She glanced back at Darren to be sure she had the right one, and when she saw him not, she walked up behind the stranger. He appeared to be in his late sixties, with gray thinning hair. He wore a suit and tie, and as she drew closer, it was clear that the suit was an older style, a fact verified by the wear she saw it, the cuffs and collar. She took a deep breath. It was showtime, sir. Excuse me, sir, I think you dropped this, she said, holding up an oversized unmarked business envelope. The man turned to look at her, and Shannon noticed that even as he looked at the envelope she was holding, he took the opportunity to give her a second look before responding. Darren knew what he was doing when he had me dressed this way. She thought approvingly, No, I'm sorry, young lady, that doesn't belong to me, the old man said with a smile. Are you sure? Shannon asked. I spotted it under the bench right where you're sitting. Again, he shook his head. No, it's not mine, but thank you for asking. Shannon plopped herself on the bench beside him and watched his eyes go to the slit in her skirt. What should we do about this envelope? She asked. It feels heavy. She passed it to him, and he waited in his hands. Then he gave it back to her. Maybe there's an address or something inside that will tell us who this belongs to. She said, being careful to look the older man in the eye. That's a good idea. He said, obviously enjoying the opportunity to spend time with a pretty young female. When she unclamped the envelope and reached inside, she gave a sharp gasp. Oh my gosh, it's filled with money. She thrust the envelope back into his hands and saw his eyes widen as he found what she had seen. How much is in there? She asked excitedly, and he pulled the stacks of bills into his lap. Now it was his turn to gasp. These are packets of dollar one hundred bills, he said in a hushed voice. He quickly began to count them, and when he had finished, he turned to her and said, There are twenty packets, and each one has twenty-five bills. That means there's fifty thousand dollars in here. She looked at him with wide eyes. Can we keep it? I mean, there's no name on the envelope and nothing inside to indicate who owns it. That would be $25,000 for each of us. She saw the desire in his eye, but he still wasn't completely hooked. I think we have to report this to the authorities in case someone lost it, he said. But when she looked disheartened, he quickly added, But maybe if no one claims it, then we can keep it. Shannon cocked her head as though an idea had just struck her. My boss is an attorney. In fact, he works in that building right across the street. Let me call him. He'll know what to do. Before her companion could respond, she pulled out her cell phone and made a show of calling her boss. After a minute's conversation, she hung up and turned back to the man. He said he was on his way to a meeting, but he's going to stop on the way to see us. Oh, look, there he comes now. She pointed to the figure of Darren, who was appropriately dressed in a dark blue suit, white shirt, and striped tie, and carrying a heavy legal briefcase. After the introductions, Shannon explained the situation to him. Darren took the envelope and checked inside, briefly looking down at Shannon and the older man. Darren nodded sagely. I know exactly what this is, he said. I've seen it before. This is drug money. Somebody was going to make a payoff and something went wrong. So what do we do now? Shannon asked. We'll have to notify the police, of course. But I'm happy to inform you that once a few formalities have been completed, the money belongs to the finders. Shannon squealed and turned to hug her co-founder in delight. He returned her embrace heartily. Before you get too excited, Darren broke in. There's one small complication. 
The two people seated on the bench looked at each other in alarm, then back at the attorney. The problem, he continued, is that an unmarked envelope is one ploy drug dealers use to launder money. They claim to have found it. Then when it goes unclaimed and they take possession, they have clean money. But we're not drug dealers, the older man protested. I know that, Darren responded, but you need to convince the police, not me. He paused for just long enough for disillusionment to set in and spoke up again. I think I know a way. If each of you were to put some of your own money in, that would demonstrate your good faith to the police. Besides, no drug dealer would ever put up his own cash like that. Shannon could see the doubt in the older man's face, so she quickly spoke up. That makes sense to me. How much would we have to put up to show good faith? What would be perfect would be if each of you could put up half of the total money. That would clearly show the police that you're honest and not trying to pull some kind of money laundering scheme again. Shannon spoke up quickly. I have a little over $25,000 in my savings account at the bank across the street. If it means a chance to double that, I'd be willing to get it, especially since we're going to give that to the police. She turned to her companion. What about you? Can you do the same thing? When he hesitated, she hurried on. My husband and I could really use $25,000. I bet that much money would come in pretty handy for you too. Yes, it would. The older man agreed, and then he seemed to make a decision. My bank is just down the street. I could pull $25,000 out of my retirement account. Perfect. Darren quickly spoke up. Now here's what you need to do. Each of you needs to go withdraw the money while I contact the police. Be sure to have your bank put the money in an envelope along with the withdrawal receipt and seal it. That way, there can be no question where the money came from. Then get back here as quickly as you can. Shannon grabbed her new friend's hand and tugged him off the bench with excitement. Come on, she said excitedly. Let's go. He gladly held her hand as they walked out of the park. After they had crossed the street, he somewhat reluctantly released her two heads to his bank. Shannon was already waiting with her envelope when the gray-haired man returned, puffing from his haste. Darren took the big envelope they'd found and opened it so both could see the $50,000 inside. Then he dumped in the envelopes from Shannon and the old man, closed the flap, licked it, and sealed it. There, he said triumphantly. That way the police will know it hasn't been tampered with. Then he made a show of checking his watch. Where are those detectives anyway? He pulled out his cell phone, turned away, made a call, and began to speak, even hearing only one side of the conversation. It was obvious to Shannon and her new friend that something was amiss. Darren turned back to the two of them, holding his finger over the speaker. There's been an accident and they've been delayed, he informed the pair. It's going to be about 15 minutes before they can get here. He looked around and then back at the two of them. Listen, I don't feel comfortable holding this much money out in the open like this. We need to put it in a safer place. He turned to the older man. Is your car parked nearby? Gray hair nodded quickly. Yes, I'm parked on the first level of the parking garage. Right over there, he said. Good, Darren said approvingly. We'll go over there and lock the envelope in the trunk of your car. I'll let the police know where to look for you. With that, he turned back around, spoke a few more sentences, and hung up. The three of them then proceeded to walk across the street and into the garage with the older man in the lead. There's my car over there, he told them, pointing to a Chevrolet in the middle of one row. As the three of them neared the car, there was a clatter of metal on concrete, and Shannon gave a little squeal. Oh, I dropped my phone. She carefully bent over at the waist and made a show of fumbling on the ground before grasping it. When she stood up, she saw that the older man had been staring at her. She held the phone out to him. Do you think it will be okay? He took it from her to examine it, and Shannon watched over his shoulder as Darren completed switching the envelope with the money for an identical one that he had pulled out of his briefcase. As Shannon and her friend turned back towards Darren, he held the envelope up and asked the old man to pop his trunk when he did so. Darren ostentatiously placed the envelope inside and loudly slammed the lid closed, asking the man to relock the car. Now I feel better, he said reassuringly. Then he checked his watch again. I'm sorry, but if I don't hurry, I'll be late for my meeting. The police should be here any minute, so you two just wait for them here by the car, before they could say anything else. He hurried away. The old man looked around uneasily, and Shannon quickly gripped her arm. So tell me, she asked with an encouraging expression, what are you going to do with all that money? Soon the man was talking about European vacations and other dreams, with Shannon nodding and smiling in agreement when he paused for a breath. A look of discomfort crossed Shannon's face. 
Darn it, I really need to go to the bathroom. I'm going to run. Use the ladies' room in the bank, and then I'll be right back. She leaned over and gave him a kiss on the cheek. Don't go away now, she said with a smile, and then hurried toward the door to the lobby. Instead of stopping, she hurried straight through the lobby. When she exited the building, she turned west and walked down the street until she came to an alley. Darren was parked there with the motor idling. When he pulled away, she was almost shaking from the adrenaline rush. How'd I do? she asked in her excitement. Like a pro baby. Like a pro, Darren responded. Now that's how you do the pigeon drop. Then he began to chuckle. I wish you could have seen it when you've been over to pick up your cell phone. That old geezer's eyes almost popped out of his head, staring at your hips. I wonder how long it will take before he opens the trunk and finds that envelope stuffed with newspaper, she asked. Long after we're out of here, Darren said. She laughed guiltily and settled back in her seat as they drove to the motel. When Darren pulled up at the motel, he turned to look at Shannon. You go on inside and wait for me. I've got to make a quick trip to the bank. What bank? She asked in confusion. The Bank of Moscow, he said calmly. The Bank of Moscow? She asked in surprise. I've never heard of it. Why do you have to go there? It's better that you don't know, he replied curtly, when he saw her, clouding up. He hurried on. When I get back, we'll go out and party, as she waited for Darren. Shannon began to think about what they'd just done. Now that the euphoria of a successful con game had worn off, she couldn't help thinking about the old man they'd just robbed. A sense of guilt welled up in her as she remembered his well-worn clothes. But she pushed it from her thoughts angrily. He's probably got tons of money stashed in the bank, she told herself. He won't miss it. Nevertheless, she began to feel a little depressed. She wanted the excitement of living with a bad boy, but she never thought that she might have to become part of his activities. My daddy would just die if he knew, she thought, and so would Robert. The thought made her angry at herself. Why should I even care what they think? She asked herself in disgust to get herself out of her mood. She fished a joint out of Darren's bag and lit up. By the time Darren returned, she was high, giggly, and hungry. Darren was amused. Come on, baby, he told her. Let's go get something to eat, and then we'll have a little playtime. A week later, Darren informed Shannon that it was time for them to move on. We're leaving as soon as I get back, he told her when she asked him where he was going. He would only tell her that it was a business meeting. After Darren returned, the two of them quickly loaded their bags into their nondescript car. Darren drove around to the motel office, settled their bill, and then got behind the wheel and headed north on I-95. Are we going back to Philadelphia? Shannon asked. No, he replied curtly. Newark? Why Newark? Shannon asked curiously. Because we've got a big business opportunity there, Darren replied. What opportunity? Shannon pressed, and Darren gave an audible sigh. All right, he said. We've got some time ahead of us, so I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about it. You remember the con I pulled in Philly with the school board? He asked, glancing over at Shannon. Of course, she replied. Well, there's a similar situation in Newark, only a lot bigger. If we play our cards right, we might just be able to make a really big score, one that would put us on easy street for a long time. Why can't we do it in Wilmington? Shannon asked in puzzlement. What's so special about Newark? Darren rolled his eyes and began to lecture her like a child. Newark runs the biggest education system in New Jersey, but it has one of the worst graduation rates in the state. The school system got so bad that the state government actually took it over way back in 1995 and has been running it ever since. The system also has a history of being underfunded and rife with corruption. That doesn't sound very promising to me, Shannon said. You'd think so, but there's another side to the coin. The problems are so well known that the system has gotten a lot of money from bleeding heart do-gooders trying to help. That guy who started Facebook donated $100 million, and other rich people have chipped in as well. Everybody's looking for ways to jumpstart the system, and that's where we come in. The confusion on Shannon's face made it clear that she still wasn't following what Darren was saying. The latest quick fix they want to try is to give computers to the students to help them with their schoolwork. Darren went on. Shannon burst into laughter. Right, like that'll help. They'll just spend all their time on Facebook or playing games. Maybe so, Darren responded. But who cares? The point is that it's a big opportunity for us. We come in and offer to sell them a whole shipping container full of iPads at current prices, and they'll jump at the offer. Where are we going to find a container full of iPads? Shannon asked incredulously. Our friends at the Bank of Moscow already have one, Darren replied. Okay, now you've got to tell me, Shannon demanded. Who the heck is the Bank of Moscow? It's not really a bank, Darren said. That's just what I call it. 
because they're willing to fund scams and underwrite other kinds of crime. The truth is, they're part of the Russian mafia. Why would the Russian mafia want to fund other people's deals? Why not just pull the jobs themselves? Simple, Darren said. They can make a lot of money without taking any risk. What happens if the can goes sour, or their borrowers get arrested? It sounds to me like that would be a big risk. They're not like a regular bank, Darren explained. If you borrow money from them, you pay it back plus interest, no. Matter what. If you wind up in jail, then your family has to pay. There's no getting out of a loan from these guys. Shannon wasn't convinced. But what if the family can't pay or won't pay? Darren actually shuddered. Trust me, you don't want to know what happens then. Let's just say that the Bank of Moscow doesn't have a bad debt problem. They always collect. So where did these Russian guys get a shipping container of iPads? Shannon wanted to know. Darren rolled his eyes at her like she was a simpleton. They hijacked it, of course, he told her. And they're just going to give it to us, she asked, still not understanding. No, Darren said slowly, as if he were speaking to a child. They're not going to give it to us. They're going to lend it to us along with the cash. We'll need a seed money. In return, they get half the proceeds of our little con game. Half? Shannon exploded. We take all the risk and they get half. It sounds like a lot. I know, but think about it. Where else have we got a chance to score two million dollars in one deal? Two million dollars? You're kidding, right? Do the math, Darren said. There are 10,000 iPads in that shipping container. And they're the fancy thin ones, with 128 gigs of memory. Those babies retail for $1.800 a pop. We sell them to the school system at half price, which makes them look like heroes and gets us $4 million. We split that with the Bank of Russia and walk away with a cool two rocks, with that kind of money. We can go anywhere, do anything. He glanced away from the road to see how she was taking all this and saw she still had a skeptical look on her face. Do you really think you can con the school board or whoever into buying stolen merchandise? She asked. He grinned at her. Our new partners tell me that the guy we have to deal with is Gordon Chesterman, the head of the Newark's Future Foundation. This guy is bent two ways. He's politically ambitious, and he's not too picky about where possible campaign funds come from. So they think he's touchable. But in any case, I'm not going to con this guy. I don't understand, she asked carelessly. How are we going to do it? He paused and grinned even more broadly. I'm not going to con him. You are me. She gasped, startled. I don't know how to do something like that. Don't worry, baby, I'll coach you every step of the way. He's going to be butter in your hands. The day after they checked into an inexpensive motel near the Newark airport, Darren and Shannon made a trip to Manhattan to go on another shopping spree. They returned with a complete wardrobe for her, including lingerie from Agent Provocateur, an Armani woman's suit in dark gray from Saks Fifth Avenue, and a pair of Burberry high-heeled ankle boots in black suede. As before, her only actual purchase was the boots for which she paid cash. The two of them spent the rest of the evening going over what Shannon was supposed to do, and how she should handle whatever questions or issues Gordon might raise. Darren had already been in contact with his office at the Foundation to set up the appointment and to introduce Miss April Johnson, Vice President of Sales for Global Resources, as the person who would call on him. All marks are the same, Darren reassured her. If you can get them to focus on the rewards, they'll convince themselves that everything else you're saying is true. Once they start to visualize the prize, they want to believe you. Shannon spent a restless night. Not only was she nervous about the role she was supposed to play, but she was especially uneasy about her increasing involvement in Darren's schemes. Yet once again, she could see no way to get off the path she had chosen. The next morning, she was so jittery that she couldn't eat anything before her appointment. But she began to feel a little better when she put on her power suit and ankle boots. Just before she left to get in the taxi to take her to the Foundation's offices, Darren told her, Remember, baby, you have a secret weapon. You're a sexy jerk. It's hard for a man to say no to someone like you. Shannon hoped he was right. Once she was settled in Ryan's office, she quickly launched into the spiel that she'd rehearsed with Darren. Global Resources, she told him, had acquired a container load of 10,000 tablets at distressed prices. These were the deluxe dollar 800 models, but her firm was in a position to offer them to the foundation at half price, if it could take the entire lot. It was a preposterous story, and Shannon was sure that men would kick her out of his office in short order. But as she went through her proposition, it soon became clear that men was paying more attention to her body than to her words to see if she was right. 
she crossed and uncrossed her legs several times, and each time he followed the motion closely, like a child looking at toys through the window of a store. I can use this, she thought, and her confidence began to grow. She quickly shifted away from the details of the deal and began to praise the work the Foundation was doing and the importance of the role system it played when she saw him respond positively. She began to describe the coup he would score by acquiring so many tablet computers for the school system. From there, she went on to speculate about the favorable publicity such an achievement would generate and the political implications of success. The people of Newark are looking for a leader who has the vision to address the city's problems and the decisiveness to get things done, she said. This could be a real inflection point for the right man. As she spoke, she kept leaning toward him, and the motion caused her jacket to gape open, revealing tantalizing glimpses of her bra-clad chest. My company would be interested in supporting such a leader, she went on sulkily. We'd be prepared to contribute seed money to help get a political campaign in motion. We'd be talking in terms of 1% of the sale as a sort of commission. That would go quite a way toward getting a mayoral campaign rolling. She could see him do the calculation. Yes, he said slowly. $40,000 would certainly be helpful. She deliberately interrupted him just the way Darren had suggested. No, Mr. Westerman, not 1% of our price to you. 1% of the retail value. His eyes widened. $80,000? Exactly, she said with a little smile. He seemed to be staring off into the distance. Then his eyes refocused on her face and narrowed. You've given me a great deal to think about, Miss Johnson, he said slowly. I'd like to have a little more time to consider your proposition before coming to a final decision. Shannon's smile broadened. Of course, Mr. Assessment, but you must realize that we have other potential opportunities for moving this merchandise. Rapid inventory turnover is the key to success for us. Mann looked at her shrewdly and nodded. I completely understand. Why don't we plan to meet tomorrow at this same time to continue our discussions? Shannon smiled, rose daintily, and extended her hand to shake his. I'll be looking forward to it, she said smoothly. Then she turned and left his office with just the slightest added sway in her hips. When she got back to Darren, she was bursting with excitement in her eagerness to describe everything that had happened. Oh God, Darren, I think it just might work. He hardly asked any questions. And when I began to talk about what this would do for him, you'd have thought I was giving him a hand job. Darren was equally excited. You know what this means, babe? If we can pull this off, we'll walk out of here with two million bucks. We can go anywhere, do anything. In his fervor, Darren grabbed her and kissed her passionately. Instantly, her excitement turned to lust, and the two of them were soon shedding their clothes as fast as they could before falling to the unmade bed in a sexual frenzy as he plunged into her. He exalted. Do you miss your old life now? Do you miss good old SpongeBob? She clasped him to her in ecstasy. The heck with him. The heck with them all. This is what I want. Just give it to me now. When Shannon returned for her follow-up appointment the next day, she was wearing another shoplifted outfit, which, while still suitable for business, featured a shorter skirt and a blouse with a dipping neckline. She strode into Settlement's office with an air of confidence and his opening response only served to reinforce her attitude. Miss Johnson, I've given your company's proposal a great deal of consideration, and I find it extremely interesting. He's hooked, she thought, working to keep the triumph from showing on her face. However, in the course of my research, I came across an interesting situation I'd like to share with you. Sentiment continued. About nine months ago, the school system in Philadelphia contracted to purchase a large quantity of cleaning supplies from a new vendor, when no supplies were ever delivered. An investigation was conducted. The head of purchasing ultimately confessed that he had accepted a bribe from the phony supplier at his words. Shannon's excitement metamorphosed into fear. Oh God, she thought, he knows about us. The police must be outside, ready to arrest me. Her heartbeat doubled and sweat began to run down from her armpits. It was all she could do to keep from dashing for the door. But what I really found interesting about the story Westerman went on was that the bribe the purchasing director received came in the form of a cashier's check. Ironically, that cashier's check was as phony as the supply contract itself. Shannon wondered if she was going to faint system and smiled smugly at her. The philosopher George Santayana famously said that those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. So rather than risk repeating that ugly lesson, 
I'm going to accept your proposal, but with three conditions. If you cannot meet all three, then we have nothing further to discuss. Shannon was stunned, unable to comprehend what was happening. He's not going to arrest me. He's actually going to take the deal, she asked herself in confusion, oblivious to his visitor's inner turmoil system, and went on. Here are my conditions. First, the campaign contribution. Your company so generously wishes to make must be in cash deliverable, concurrent with the delivery of the merchandise. Shannon had recovered somewhat from her panic, but Settlement's condition was a disturbing development. How are we going to get $80,000 in cash? She asked herself. But she kept her face impassive, and system, and went on. The second condition is that I have to see the merchandise myself. I'm not buying anything until I see all 10,000 of those iPads. When Shannon remained silent and smiled and cleared his throat. My third condition is of a different, more personal nature. Before we conclude our transaction, you will need to spend a night with me at the Meadowlands Hilton. Shannon gasped and jumped out of her chair, staring at Sister Man in shock. But before she could tell him where to stick his conditions, she caught herself and slowly sat back down, struggling to control herself. She told him I was not expecting something like this from you, Mr. Chesterman. I am taken aback by what you're demanding. I believe the best thing for me to do is to discuss this with my colleagues. Good day, sir. With that, she arose again and stalked to the door. Testament's parting words caused her to stop. Please don't take too long, thinking it over, Miss Johnson. My offer is time-sensitive. Rapid inventory turnover, you know. Shannon ground her teeth in fury, but said nothing further when she got back to the motel. Her angry scowl told Darren that things had gone awry before she could even speak. He demanded, What happened? What went wrong? When she told him about Testament's demand for his money in cash, Darren didn't see it as an unsolvable problem. I didn't expect that. But I think we can work around it. Let me talk to the Russians and see what they say. Likewise, Testament's requirement to see the merchandise didn't phase Darren either. The Russians have got the container at Port Newark. I'll work out a special showing for Westermen when I call them about the dollar eighty Big ones, this can work for us. Shannon, it'll be okay. Shannon was becoming angrier by the second. No, it won't, she shouted, because I'm not going to sleep with that pig. That's his third condition, Darren exclaimed. He wants to screw you. This is great. It means he's in. We've got him, baby. We've got him. Shannon was taken aback by his response. I'm not a hooker, she protested. I don't want to spend the night with that sanctimonious crap. Darren grabbed her by the shoulders so tightly that Shannon winced. Grow up, Shannon, he yelled at her. It's time you understood that in this game, you use every trick you've got. Yesterday, you were bragging about crossing your legs and showing him a little tit. You're already using love to sell. Now just use a little more to seal the deal. But what about you and me? Shannon asked, almost in tears. How are you going to feel about me if I have love with him? Darren put his arms around her and hugged her. Then he raised her chin so he could look her in the eye. Oh, baby, I'll love you even more if you pull this off. This is like winning the World Series. It's huge. One night with a mark means nothing to me. Shannon looked up at him, wanting to believe it was okay, but she still wasn't happy. She hadn't wanted to be part of the con in the first place, and now felt like she was being used by Darren for that matter. The look that she'd seen in his eyes just now hadn't reassured her yet. She wanted to make him proud of her, and she had to admit she wanted the rewards this job could bring to them. After a few minutes, she reluctantly told Darren she would do what he wanted. With that crisis averted, Darren wanted to return to other conditions and he'd already come up with a plan. Now that we know we've got him, I think that we can use the cash as a lever against him. With Darren's coaching, Shannon called in to tell him that the deal was acceptable and she agreed to meet him at the hotel two nights hence. Chesterman was obviously elated, but Miss Johnson brought him back to earth quickly. We have a condition of our own. If you want our campaign contribution in cash, you'll have to deliver payment for the computers in cash as well. System, and began to rant, but Shannon cut him short. Fair is fair, says Ian. Just as you're ensuring that you won't be scanned by a phony cashier's check, we have to ensure we won't be scanned by a phony order. This way, everyone is on an equal footing, and there can be no misunderstandings. Chesterman was outraged. How in the heck do you expect me to get my hands on $2 million in cash? And even if I could, the biggest bill in circulation is $100. Do you have any idea how much that much cash would weigh? Shannon put her phone on mute and looked at Darren with a worried expression. But Darren told her, hold firm. 
She took the cell phone off, Newton said. If you can't do the cash, then give us another option. Otherwise, the deal is off system and continued to fume, but after a few minutes he calmed down. What about Eurobonds? He asked suddenly. They're just like cash. The foundation has a substantial quantity of Eurobonds in its endowment. I could tap those for this purchase. Would that work? When Shannon looked over at Darren, he shrugged his shoulders uncertainly, then quickly scribbled on a piece of paper and held it up to her. Let me consult with our financial people, Mr. Chesterman, Shannon said. I should be able to call you back within the hour. When Shannon had hung up, Darren quickly made a call to his Russian contact and began to explain what had happened. Then he listened for quite a while before hanging up. What did they say? Shannon asked apprehensively. The Russians told me that euro bonds are issued by corporations and governments in Europe. They're just like bearer bonds. Whoever possesses the certificates can redeem them for cash at any time. The Russians said they use them frequently as a way to launder money. As long as the bonds are legitimate, they'll take them. So what does that mean? Shannon asked, uncertainly. Darren began to dance her around the room. It means we've got him, he crowed. He wants this deal bad. I'll bet he's probably already started writing his campaign announcement when they calmed down. Shannon called back and confirmed that payment in eurobonds would be acceptable. The deal was on after her initial elation wore off. Shannon's emotions began to fluctuate up and down. Darren kept praising her, telling her that the scam could not succeed without her, and she liked the feeling that she was so important to him. At other times, however, she felt like she was nothing more than a pawn being used in Darren's game, and she wondered how Darren really felt about her. Having love with Chesterman didn't bother her that much. What she really resented was the idea that he could force her into prostitution. The fact that Darren was so willing to put her in that role rankled even more. Despite all her misgivings, two days later, Shannon found herself walking through the lobby of the Meadowlands Hilton. She was wearing a dark gray maxi dress that fluttered around the heels of her Ferragamo pumps. The knit fabric hugged the curves of her figure enticingly, but the most striking feature of the outfit was the cowl back that draped low enough to reveal her braless back. The outfit, which Darren had helped her procure the day before, was a perfect mix of sexy and sophisticated. She had purposely arrived early and positioned herself on the far side of the lobby when she saw Chesterman walk in. She waited until she knew he had spotted her, then turned away from him to display the arch of her back that her dress revealed. He almost broke into a run in his haste to get to her side over a dinner, accompanied by several bottles of wine, and talked at great length about the work of the Foundation. His boastful description made clear that all its achievements were directly attributable to his leadership. Shannon made a point of appearing fascinated, but her thoughts wandered as she listened to sentiment. Out of the corner of her eye, she spotted a man who looked a lot like her father. The resemblance triggered memories of her father lecturing her. You can't do that, Shannon. Good girls don't act that way. You don't want people to talk about you. Shannon had been headstrong growing up, and with that memory, all her teenage rebelliousness welled up in her again. I'll do what I want, she thought, and nobody can tell me otherwise. All her previous reluctance evaporated, and she actually began to relish the idea of playing a prostitute. Impulsively, she leaned across the table and interrupted Testament's monologue. That's very interesting, she said in a purr. But wouldn't you like to take a bottle of wine upstairs and continue the conversation in your room? The fire in her eyes gave him all the incentive he needed, and he quickly settled the bill in the elevator. Her newfound aggressiveness kicked in full force. She grabbed him by the tie and pulled him to her mouth for a passionate kiss that took his breath away. I knew you were hot, he moaned in the room. She continued to take charge. Once the door was locked, she grabbed the bottle of wine and took several large swigs directly from the bottle. Then she pushed him in down into a chair and stood before him, slowly sliding the dress off her shoulders, allowing it to slip down her arms a little at a time. It was wild and rough. Screw them, she exulted to herself. Screw them all in. Darren, Robert, Daddy, all of them. I do what I want with that. She arched her back and screamed as her climax overcame her sister man's climax, only prolonged the sensations within her. Finally it ended, and she slumped down on his chest. After a minute, she rolled over on her side and quickly fell asleep. Several hours later, she awoke in confusion, uncertain where she was, but the view of the lights of Manhattan through the window quickly brought back everything that had transpired that evening. As she came more fully awake, 
a feeling of elation came over her. She reveled in the idea that she had conned and seduced this Mark, who would soon turn over $2 million in cash to them, while she lay there thinking about the money and what she and Darren would do with it. Then Shannon rolled away and fell asleep almost before her head hit the pillow. When she awoke the next morning, the sun was streaming through the windows. Her head was throbbing with a hangover, and her mouth tasted like food had decayed in it. When she opened her eyes and looked over the side of the bed, all she could make out were a pair of legs dressed in suit pants and lace-up shoes standing in front of her, then sat down in a nearby chair and said brusquely, Now let's talk business. It was clear to Shannon that the passivity she had witnessed in him last night had disappeared with the morning. Here's the way it's going to go down, he said in a curt voice. You are going to meet me at my office at 5 p.m. this afternoon. You bring the $80,000 with you in a briefcase. Come alone. No one else or the deal's off. I'll have the euro bonds waiting. I'll count the cash. And you count the bonds to be sure everything's kosher. Then, once we're both satisfied, you and I will drive to a storage locker I've rented. You bring a heavy-duty padlock, and I'll have one as well. We'll both lock the money up so neither one can pull any tricks. We'll leave the money in the locker while we go inspect the merchandise at the container terminal. Once I've had a chance to verify that you really have the tablets, you and I will drive back to the storage locker and each of us will collect our money. He paused. Got it? He asked when she nodded. He stared at her a moment longer. Remember, no tricks, he said. Shannon held his gaze, hoping that the distaste she felt for him wasn't visible. No tricks. All that's going to happen is that everyone is going to walk away getting exactly what they want system, and gave her a thin smile and headed for the door. Then he paused and looked back at her. Oh, and I was right. You are a great piece of meat, he said with a smirk. Shannon simply stared at him, and he turned and left. When she got back to the motel, Darren was waiting impatiently for her and wouldn't leave her alone until she had described the encounter. He seemed particularly interested in hearing about the love, and Shannon couldn't understand why he wanted her to go into detail when she described the scenario and had outlined for the afternoon's transaction. Darren got a thoughtful look on his face. I'll have to scramble, he said, but I think we can make this work. Let me go talk to the Russians and make some plans. With that, he left Shannon to pack their meager possessions in anticipation of a quick getaway. Once they pulled off the scam as she stuffed their bags, she found herself feeling depressed again. The rebelliousness of the night before was gone, to be replaced by self-doubt assessments. Treatment of her that morning had made clear the true nature of what she'd become, and she felt ashamed of herself. She tried telling herself that she didn't care what others thought, but somehow she wasn't convinced. To lift her spirits, she returned to thinking about what she and Darren might do with the money. I'd really like to see Paris, she thought. I've always heard it's really nice. She pictured herself walking by the Eiffel Tower, shopping at exclusive French salons and dining and fine restaurants. The thoughts lifted her mood, and she was almost back to normal when Darren returned. He walked into the motel room, carrying a large briefcase. Okay, he said. I think we've got it all worked out. He patted the briefcase inside this case, our 80 Gs. You need to guard it with your life until it's locked up in that storage unit, because if anything happens to it, the Russians will be on us like a shark on a seal. Shannon shuddered at that image, and then asked, So how's it all going to work? It's probably better if you don't know, Darren replied. That way you can't inadvertently give anything away. Shannon didn't appreciate his lack of confidence in her, but before she could say anything... He hurried on. There's one more bit of acting you'll need to do to seal the deal. Then we're home free. She listened to his instructions and gave a small smile. I can do that, she said confidently. Just before 5 p.m., Darren dropped Shannon off outside the Foundation offices. Just remember, baby, in an hour of so we'll be rich, he said encouragingly. Shannon began walking toward the building, lugging the briefcase. Darren had handled it up to now and she was surprised to discover just how much all those stacks of $100 bills weighed. Chesterman was waiting for her anxiously when he tried to take the briefcase from her. She snatched it back. Easy, easy, he soothed. I'm just going to count it. He pointed to a metal-clad carrying case on the table nearby. The Eurobonds are in there. You can check them out if you want. Shannon went over to Sister Mine's briefcase and quickly totaled the face value of the bonds. Next, she pulled one of the bonds from the middle of the stack and took a picture of it with her cell phone. Then she emailed the photo to the account she'd been given. In a few minutes, her phone rang, and a voice with a Slavic accent said, They're real. You can proceed. 
She silently heaved a sigh of relief and nodded. It's... it's all right, he said. Let's get going. They each picked up their briefcases and went out to sell Mercedes. He drove for a couple of miles in silence until they came to a somewhat run-down self-storage facility. Shannon's doubts must have showed on her face because Sister volunteered. I chose this place because nobody ever comes here. We won't be disturbed, System, and pulled up in front of one of the roll-up doors, and they both got out when he'd unlocked the padlock and pulled up the door. Shannon saw that here was nothing inside, except a shelf unit along one wall system, and slid his briefcase onto a shelf and beckoned her to do the same with hers. The money will be safe here until we get back from the container terminal, he told her. They exited the storage unit and snapped his padlock shut. Then Shannon attached the padlock that she brought along in her purse. Now neither one of us can get in without the other, she told him. He nodded with grudging appreciation. All right, she said when they were back in the car. Let's go have a look at a lot of tablet system and headed east and pulled onto the on-ramp to Lincoln Highway, heading south, when he reached Port Street. He looped around, heading east, and then turned south on Corbin Street and into the Port Newark Container Terminal. The place was enormous, and Shannon had to pull out the directions that Darren had given her to tell him where to find what they were looking for. They slowly drove past row after row of brightly colored shipping containers in the background. Loading cranes loomed like giant orange birds against the skyline. Eventually, they turned into a narrow street formed by the multicolored containers, and Shannon directed Westerman to stop next to one painted a bright blue. She checked the numbers on the end of the container against the sheet from her purse, then looked up at it. This is it, she told him. She handed him a key, and he quickly unlocked the padlock and opened one of the two doors. The 40-feet-long container was filled with large boxes bearing the familiar Apple logo system, and pulled a folding knife out of his pocket and quickly opened one of the boxes, revealing a stack of smaller boxes inside. He slit one open and pulled out an iPad, giving an exultant cry as he did so. I told you, Shannon said. Then, just as Darren had told her, she added, but you'll want to check the boxes in the back just to make sure they're all the same. You're right. Sister Inn agreed eagerly and began clambering over the top of the large boxes to get to the far end of the container. When he had almost reached the back, Shannon could wait no longer and began trying to close the container door. When he heard the hinges creaking system and turned and yelled, What the heck are you doing? Frantically, he began scrambling back toward the front door. Shannon desperately tried to close the door, but the locking pulse stuck and she wasn't strong enough to move. It assessed him and got nearer. She turned in fear and ran back up the alley of cargo containers until she came to the street, yelling in rage, and clambered out of the container and took off after her, only to see her hop into Darren's waiting car. Quickly, he turned and ran back to his Mercedes to chase after them. But before he could get out of the cul-de-sac, an 18-wheeler pulled across the entrance to the alley, blocking the way, and angrily jumped out of his car and demanded that the driver move. But the man responded in a language that Sister didn't understand. Then the driver and his helper began unloading their truck while Sister Man stood there cursing in frustration. Shannon was still shaking as she and Darren drove out of the container terminal and headed for the self-storage unit. I felt like I was running in tar, she gasped. I was sure he was going to catch me. Darren just grinned. You don't need to worry about Sister Man, he chuckled. Those truckers have orders to keep him there an hour before they move their rig. We'll be long gone by then. Won't he call the police? She asked anxiously, and send them to the storage unit to find all that cash and those eurobonds. Not likely. That would be the end of his political dreams for sure. Darren laughed when they pulled into the self-storage unit. The place was deserted. Shannon quickly ran to the door of Testament's unit and used the key to unlock her padlock. While she was doing that, Darren opened the trunk of his car and pulled out a pair of bolt cutters. It took a little doing, but the shackle was no match for the heavy-duty cutters. Quickly, Darren grabbed the handle and raised the door. Here we go, he said with glee, and ducked inside. Shannon followed, only to see Darren frantically scouring the insides of the small container. Then he whirled around, grabbed Shannon's shoulders, and began to shake her. Where are the briefcases? he yelled. Where's the money? Shannon twisted free of his grip and went over to the bare shelving unit to look for herself. We left them right here, she said in confusion. I know they were here. Sister man must have taken them. Darren cried, grasping for some explanation. No, he didn't. Shannon shrilled. I saw them with my own two eyes. They were on the shelf when we locked the door. Darren grabbed his head and began to moan when he looked up at her. 
She saw that his face had gone pale. Oh God, oh God, he cried. This is bad, this is very bad. The Russians will kill us if we don't get them their money. His fear caused Shannon to panic. It's not our fault, Darren, she cried desperately. Somebody must have stolen it. The Russians will understand, they have to. You don't get it. These are really bad people. I know what they've done to others who owed them money. And we owe them a crap pile of it. We're as good as... Dead now, Shannon yelled, grabbing at Darren's arm. We can talk to them, we can pull another con and then pay them back. Let me go. You stupid jerk. Darren screamed at her, shoving her so hard that she fell to the concrete floor, bruising her hip. I've got to get out of here. As she looked up in shock, he dashed out of the storage unit and headed straight for the car. Wait for me, she yelled, struggling to get to her feet. But Darren ignored her and started the engine. But before he could even get the car in motion, two large black SUVs pulled into the driveway, blocking him in completely. Several large men ran to the car door and yanked Darren out of the driver's seat. In seconds, they had bound his hands behind him and thrust him into the back seat of one of the SUVs. As she stood there, paralyzed at the sight, Shannon felt rough hands grab her arms and twist them behind her back. Heavy plastic bands tightened around her wrists, and then she was propelled toward the opposite door of the same SUV that held Darren. Once she was inside, another plastic band was wrapped around her ankles, and she was totally helpless in terror. She glanced over at Darren, only to watch in horror as one of the men pulled a burlap sack over his head. Then her own vision went dark as she felt the rough cloth envelop her face. She began to plead with her captors, but a rough voice ordered her to keep quiet, and she obeyed out of fear. As the car sped up, Shannon suddenly remembered Robert's account of the mob execution he had investigated, the night she'd met Darren. Now his description of the double murders came back to her, in lurid detail, and she began to sob in terror at the thought of her face being blown off inside the burlap bag. Hot, burning tears flooded down her cheeks, and mucus ran over her upper lip and into her mouth. She had to gasp to breathe, which only made her cry harder. Her panic-stricken mind desperately groped for some miracle that might provide salvation. Maybe someone will see us like this and report it to the police, she thought. But then she remembered the tinted windows and lapsed into self-pity. It's not fair, she thought. I'm not a bad person. I don't deserve to die. But when she thought about the way she treated Robert and her family, she was forced to admit that she wasn't a very good person after all. In her feverish state, even the figure of the old man they bilked in Wilmington came back to accuse her as her thoughts went to her family. She tried to recall the religion her father had worked in vain to instill in her. She mentally began to bargain with God, promising to change her life to be a better person. If only he would spare her. But try as she might, she could not recall any prayers. And finally, she slumped down in her seat in abject despair. From her side, she heard a sound, and she realized that Darren was whimpering and to think I thought he was a bad boy. She raged to herself. The car went around a curve just then, causing her to shift on the seat, and the pain from her bruised hip reminded her of Darren's cowardly attempt to flee without her. She silently began to curse him and herself for her fascination with him. Abruptly, the car made a sharp turn, and the vibrations from the tires made it clear that they had turned onto an unpaved road. A new jolt of terror shot through Shannon. We are at the landfill, she thought and began to sob again. The SUV abruptly braked to a stop, almost throwing Shannon into the seat in front of her. The door beside her was thrown open, and she shrieked as she felt hands groping her legs. Hold still, a voice gruffly ordered, and then the plastic band around her ankles fell off. Now a hand grabbed her and pulled her from the car. The unknown abductor led her forward and she could hear Darren shuffling alongside her. They stumbled their way over the rough ground for some twenty yards and then stopped. Strong hands gripped her shoulders and forced her down on her knees. The ground was rocky, but in her fear, Shannon hardly noticed a voice to one side of the mast. How much longer? Five minutes max, another voice replied. At first, Shannon was perplexed, but the awful truth came to her quickly. She had less than five minutes to live. She started to slump to the ground, but a hand roughly pulled her back up. Then as she knelt there, shivering in terror, she heard the sound of footsteps approaching from behind, and suddenly light flooded through the loose weave of the burlap. It must be the car headlights, she thought. And then she shrieked as she felt a hand at the back of her head. At that instant, the bag was yanked off her head, and in the blinding light, all she could see was a pair of legs standing in front of her. Was this what you wanted? A bitter voice rang out, and Shannon gasped. That sounds like Robert's voice. 
she thought in disbelief. Is this really the life you wanted? Living like a common criminal always on the run with someone like him? The voice asked again. Now Shannon knew she was right. Now Robert's voice dropped in level, but was raw with emotion. I would have given you anything. Shannon had done anything to make you happy. I would have taken a bullet for you. She could do nothing but hang in her head in shame and misery. Here, he said sharply. And when she looked up, she saw him reach into the inside pocket of his jacket. Involuntarily, she flinched. But instead of the pistol she feared, he pulled out an envelope and threw it on the ground in front of her. Since you wanted it so badly, here are your divorce papers, he said bitterly. Then he stared at her for a minute, then raised his head and looked around at the others. I'm done here. You can have the two of them now, he said, and walked away from the kneeling pair. One of the other figures, standing outside the circle of light, spoke up. All right, people, the show's over. Let's get back to work. Shannon and Darren were pulled to their feet with their hands still bound behind them. They were led to the SUV and maneuvered into the back seat. Someone dumped the envelope in Shannon's lap. In minutes, they were on the highway heading southeast. Darren was the first to recover from the ordeal, and in an angry voice, he demanded, What the heck was that all about? The figure in the passenger side of the front seat turned around, and Shannon was surprised to see that it was an attractive African-American woman. That was a little professional courtesy. We provided to a fellow FBI agent who wanted a chance to confront his ex-wife. She said, We decided to add the theatrics. The FBI. Darren sneered. I should have known. How long have you been after us? The agent laughed. Heck, you two are just little fish in a big pond. We weren't even after you two. We were just using you as bait to get the real bad guys, the Russian mafia. We rounded up the whole lot of them this afternoon. Comprehension dawned in his eyes and Darren angrily snapped at her. You were the ones who took the money from the storage locker. The woman just grinned at him. Of course we took it. Evidence. You know. Darren glared at her with hatred. You a-hole. He cursed you stupid schmuck. You should be thanking us. The agent shot back. If we hadn't arrested them, your friends the Russians were planning to off the two of you as soon as you got the money out of the storage locker. We've had you and them under surveillance for a long time. We heard them. Planet Shannon gasped, and Darren's bravado evaporated. After a while, Shannon meekly asked, Where are we going now? The agent looked at her for the first time. Why the Essex County Jail, of course, she said. What did you expect? Shannon's face drooped to her chest and the agent gazed back and forth at the pair in the back seat for a minute. Finally, she got a puzzled look on her face and turned to Shannon. Why in the world would you leave Robert Cunningham for this little piece of crap? Shannon couldn't look her in the eye. I guess I always had a thing for bad boys. What? Bad boy? The agent asked contemptuously. You mean that little coward with the wet pants where he pissed himself? Shannon glanced over and saw that the crotch of Darren's jeans was soaked when he saw her looking. He turned his face away to stare out the window. The agent driving the car swore he pissed himself. Darn, I'm going to have to clean the back seat again. The female agent laughed and then turned back to Shannon. You wanted a bad boy? She asked scornfully. You were married to one of the baddest FBI agents on the East Coast. That man already has more decorations for bravery than most agents hope for in an entire career. Your ex-husband has busted my bosses, bank robbers, and serial killers. And you wanted a bad boy. I never knew. Shannon said in a small voice. Yeah, you didn't know, the woman said harshly. And you nearly killed him. A lot of us thought that he wasn't going to make it after you ran out on him. That man loved you so much and you treated him like he was a piece of trash on the street. She took a deep breath to calm herself. But after tonight, I think he'll be okay. And when he's back on the market, there are a lot of single ladies in the bureau who are going to be after him. And you know what? I might just be one of them. The agent behind the wheel gave a mock groan. Darn, Alice, I thought you were hot for me. The female laughed and playfully cuffed his shoulder. Shut up, Ray. You know your wife would skin you alive if she heard you talking like that. Before she could say anything more, the driver announced, We are here, and made a sharp turn into the admitting area of the blue-painted complex of the Essex County Correctional Facility. Shannon and Darren were escorted into the building and led down a corridor. As they walked along the fluorescent-lit hallway, the female agent took Shannon's arm and pulled her off to the right away from Darren. They came to an empty holding cell, and after the agent directed Shannon inside, she slammed the door shut and left. Shannon slumped down on the cot that was chained to the wall 
and began to try to process everything that had happened to her. The extreme events she'd experienced, from the adrenaline rush of the sting and testament, to the terror of imminent death, from the flood of relief, when she realized she would live to the shame of Robert's confrontation, had left her emotionally exhausted. Thinking about how Darren had abandoned her to try to save himself, she felt glad to be separated from him, even if he hadn't tried to abandon me. She thought his Russian friends would have killed us. How could I ever have been tempted to run away with someone like him? She revealed herself. Then she recalled what the female FBI agent had told her about Robert. It was clear that the woman had a completely different view of the man she had married. She thinks he's a hero, Shannon marveled. She thinks he's hot. A clang from somewhere in the building caused her to look up, and the sight of the bar door reminded her of the future she faced. The thought of spending years of her life in prison was deeply depressing, and the worst of it was that she had no one to blame but herself. Suddenly, the female agent reappeared at the bars. She unlocked the cell door and beckoned to Shannon. Come on, she said, and led Shannon down a corridor that ended at a door. When she opened it, cool night air hit Shannon's face. They were in the parking lot, and a car was waiting with the engine running. Shannon looked back at the agent in confusion. What's happening? But the agent simply motioned her toward the waiting vehicle. Then the door opened and a familiar figure got out. Daddy! She cried out in disbelief, and when she saw that it was in fact her father, she dashed to him and threw her arms around him, sobbing into his lapels. I'm so sorry, Daddy. I'm so sorry for everything, she sobbed. Let's go, honey, he said in a voice choked with emotion, and she let him lead her to the passenger side of his car. Where are we going? she asked. We're going home, honey, he said gently. But I don't understand, she said plaintively. Why am I free? How did you know to come get me here? As her father pulled out onto Dormus Avenue and headed toward the on-ramp for the New Jersey Turnpike, he glanced over at his prodigal daughter. Robert called me, he said. He asked me to give you a message, he said. Tell her this is a parting gift from Spongebob. Shannon gave a little cry of pain and began to weep again. She couldn't decide whether her unexpected and wholly undeserved redemption was an act of kindness by Robert or the harshest punishment he could have inflicted on her.